All right, for a change of pace here, uh, this project does not feature any Go or any Swift. So just prepare yourselves right now. Oh. All right, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Noah Anderson, and I'm a lead systems engineer at Kanji. Systems engineering at Kanji is a small but mighty team. Uh, we work on a lot of different things, uh, build out a lot of cool tools, uh, but one of the main things that we're responsible for uh, is a product called AutoApps. If you haven't heard of AutoApps, you can think of it like macOS applications as a service. Right? We're essentially uh, providing macOS applications uh, to our customers to help bridge some of the software availability gap uh, that you would see on something like iOS with the App Store. So, as you might expect, uh, wheeling and dealing with macOS applications uh, means that we run our own flavor of auto PKG uh, internal at Kanji. So today, I'm gonna walk through some runtimes and trade-offs that we considered when our existing auto PKG infrastructure was getting pretty long in the tooth and was in dire need of a serious makeover. I'll talk through uh, what is and how we settled on cashless auto PKG. And then finally, I'll give you a walkthrough of how it all works. But before we embark upon our choose your own adventure, we're gonna do a little primer on auto PKG and how it works. First off, I just wanna say what an incredible credit auto PKG is to the community. Uh, it is an engineering marvel and uh, really speaks to the devotion of the Mac admins community. Uh, it's a really functional framework built on top of Python. Everybody loves Python, right? Right? <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, so the way that Auto PKG works is it runs recipes, which are essentially plists, uh, which include instructions uh, for how to grab an app and then kind of what to do with it once you've gotten it. Uh, to that end, it'll usually use a tool like curl uh, to reach out to uh, a URL download uh, and then grab that down. Those applications are usually wrapped in something like a .zip, a .dmg, or a .pkg. Uh, once that exists on disk, AutoPKG will go ahead and extract the application. It'll also do some security checks for code signature verification, uh, as well as uh, grabbing version information and that kind of stuff. And then finally, once you've got your application, AutoPKG will go ahead and turn it into a package, just like the name says. So AutoPKG really wants to save you time whenever it can, right? It's a pretty well-designed system, and one of the ways it does that is with the download cache. You can think of this as all of the downloads that AutoPKG previously ran and pulled down to your local system, right? All of the downloads for all of the software that you've grabbed for all of the older versions. The way that it saves you time is that when AutoPKG kicks off and starts running its recipe, curl will activate, uh, communicate with uh, the web download URL and get some more metadata about it. Uh, this queries the headers uh, and returns two specific pieces of metadata. Uh, the e tag, which is kind of a unique signature, uh, as well as the date modified, the last time that the object was actually uploaded. Then AutoPKG will actually ask the same questions to the download that already exists on disk, asking, hey, what's your e tag? And hey, when's your last modified date? AutoPKG actually attaches this information to a download after it pulls it down uh, writing those, that same information that it gets from the curl headers. If those values actually line up and match exactly, then great. There's nothing else to do, and Auto PKG just saved you a whole bunch of time and downloads. So going back to our choose your own adventure, a little while ago, as I mentioned, our Auto PKG runtime was getting a little long in the tooth. We were running an on-prem infrastructure uh, and felt a lot of the uh, associated downsides that you get from running on-prem. That Mac Mini in your closet has everything configured and set up just right. It's kind of your own little special pet. <laughs> but that also makes it pretty fragile and one of a kind. Really, it means that you're putting all of your eggs in one basket. Because if and when disaster strikes and everything goes up in flames, What's left on the other end is a sad Mac admin, or as I like to call them, just a sadman. <laughs> that has to deal with downtime, uh, restoring, uh, heaven forbid, from scratch, uh, or at the very least from backups that have been captured. 
So we knew that we really wanted a cloud approach for our replatform here. Cloud is great. Uh, when disaster strikes and everything goes up in flames, it's nice and redundant, resilient. Uh, that doesn't let you get you down. Uh, it's flexible. It can kind of scale up and down uh, based on the needs of your environment. And cloud affords uh, expanded visibility into changes made for the runtime uh, or backend with uh, source control and logging, that kind of stuff. But let's talk about the elephant in the room. Where to store all of the cache downloads that AutoPKG uses? We had many gigabytes of downloads, even for just N minus one of all of the apps. As we continue to grow our catalog, this would only grow in size. And the prospect of regularly schlepping dozens of gigabytes back and forth multiple times a day, every day, was not exactly an appealing proposition. So neither was discarding the cache after each run. That means full downloads come down every single time, right? You don't have a reference to compare against, so you might need to pull down the downloads to see, hey, is this actually a version that I already have packaged and made available, or is this something net new? So if you don't run a cache like this, uh, that means that it can be very expensive both in terms of time that it actually takes to download all these files, as well as compute. So eventually, we landed on a solution that allowed us to kind of have the best of both worlds. It reaped the benefits of the reference cache, but instead of dealing with a cache of this size for about a dozen or so recipes, we ended up with this, a cache that was 99.998% smaller in size. Now, you might be asking yourself, Noah, did these gigabytes fall into a tear in the space-time continuum? Is this some kind of black magic? Did you just Photoshop this picture? The answer is none of the above. <laughs> we'll walk through a bit of how this works, and then I'll pull back the curtain. So for our auto app setup at Kanji, we have a lot more pieces involved than what you see up here. Uh, but what I'll demo today is a retooled, open source version everybody can try. It has local variations of some CI CD tools, and a lot of the Kanji specific stuff is stripped out. So to get us started with our cacheless setup here, not Go, not Swift, but actually Z Shell. Uh, I find that Z Shell is great for setup and bootstrapping, uh, Mac OS installing, process monitoring, writing to disk, tasks that mostly confirm success from exit codes. We've got Python 3 here as well, uh, which will be used to run and cache auto PKG. Uh, it'll be used to interact and parse some of the semi-structured data uh, that we interact with as part of our flow. Think plists, JSON files. And then both Docker and Mac OS, uh, either one could be used as a host, uh, something typically done from a CI CD runner. We bring the cloud down to us uh, with a locally cloned Anka VM uh, from Veer2. And then our auto PKG download metadata is preserved and recreated from a JSON file. And finally, all of the start results and end of an execution gets posted to a Slack channel specified from a webhook. So let's take a quick look at this runtime in action. Hopefully this is visible. Uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, you'll see kind of a checklist of all of the steps that are executing. Uh, in the middle, you've got kind of the terminal execution as it runs through. Uh, and then on the right, you've got a Slack channel that I set up here uh, that will tell you as packages uh, are built, uh, and then the runtime starts off and then finishes with execution. So we're kicking off for our build here. Uh, it detects that we don't have Anka installed locally. Uh, so we'll go ahead and pull that down. You'll be prompted for your suit password if you haven't already entered it recently. Once that's done and the license is accepted, uh, it'll prompt us if we want to download a brand new version of Mac OS to turn into a VM. We've got a little bit of movie magic here. Uh, we're speeding things along because watching downloads is, well, frankly, boring. But then once we've got the latest version of Mac OS pulled down, we go ahead and create a VM from it, clone it. We'll launch Docker since that is gonna be used for running our backend process, and then build an image from it. 
Next steps are creating an SSH key and deploying it to our remote VM. And then on the VM, we download AutoPKG, install it, customize it a little bit to our liking, uh, and then we install Rosetta as well, since there are some components for AutoPKG that are still Intel only. And we're off to the races. So you can see that we've kicked off our AutoPKG runs, and we're already starting to kick off our 14 recipes. It's about a minute in total, so you unfortunately get to hear me monologue a little bit. So while these are building, uh, I want to express gratitude to two companies, uh, Facebook and Gusto, uh, who built and added significantly to an open source AutoPKG tools framework. Uh, this is uh, part of what we used uh, to adapt and build on uh, to make kind of our cashless flow a reality. So tip of the hat and my sincere thanks to them both. Let's see, we're in the P's here, getting close to the end. And how many of you are getting PTSD looking at some of these packages that are getting uh, downloaded and built here? <laughs> All right, so zoom at the very end here should be our last package that we're grabbing. All right, so you can see here, uh, we've uh, finished our runner on the right-hand side here, uh, reported the runtime in total, about 15 minutes. Uh, we copy back all of the results uh, that we've gotten, and as well as the metadata in JSON form. Uh, so let's go ahead and just run a cat on that and take a look at what's inside. So within this metadata file, uh, we've got five attributes that we're really preserving. Three of them are actually useful, well, four. Uh, one is the URL, where we're pulling down the download. Uh, another one is path name, where it lives on disk. We've got our e tag and our date modified. Uh, those are the extended attributes that AutoPKG uses to check if a download is new. And then we've got the download size in bytes. Essentially, how big is the download once it actually exists on disk? So if we hop into our VM, take a look at the cache that we've got up here. Let's go ahead and go spelunking into some of these folders. See that Acrobat Pro pulled down, a little more than a gig. Microsoft Remote Desktop, oh, it's tidy, just 70 megs. Docker, about a half a gig. But if we take the sum total of everything that we have in our cache here, just get that summary info for the downloads folder, see that it clocks in at, yeah, 8.3 gigabytes, give or take. So, wonder if we can do better. Let's plan to tear this down, delete our VM, uh, and then see what happens after we just take a cacheless approach going from this metadata that we have in our JSON file. So we'll delete the VM that we have up, go ahead and reclone so we're starting fresh out of the box. All right, that's cloned. Once again, we'll launch Docker uh, and then build and run uh, the containerized image that we've got. Generate and deploy our SSH keys for remote VM interaction. Uh, and then once again, uh, go through our bootstrapping to download, configure, install AutoPKG as well as Rosetta. So you'll see something a little bit different here where, oh, all of these extended attributes and byte size files are writing to this AutoPKG cache. It's interesting. Hmm, I wonder what that's about. So really quickly, we're running through all of our recipes. It's the exact same that we just ran, so AutoPKG shouldn't find anything new for us to download. That's right, we've pulled back all of our results. And then let's go take a look on the VM, what's happening here. So we hop into the cache. We'll take a look here. We don't have any packages that got created because we didn't have any new updates. But if we go ahead and look at some of the downloads in our cache, you can see, oh, it looks like Android Studios, a little more than a gig. PowerPoint, a little less than a gig. Word, a little more than a gigabyte. So it certainly looks like it's sizable. But once again, if we go and grab the summary info to see how much disk space is this actually using, this comes down to 152 kilobytes in total, which is 54,000 times smaller. So if we go ahead and interrogate one of these downloads specifically, uh, let's just use Tableau Desktop, get a little more information about it, and see that we've got extended attributes attached to it. We can go ahead and actually pass the dash L flag to see what they are. And then if we go ahead and run an LS, <laughs> yes, LSLA on it, uh, we will see that the byte size there is about 650 megs in total. But once again, if we look at the actual disk usage from DU, uh, we set it at a tidy four kilobytes in total. So 
At the end here, time to pull back the curtain and reveal that this download file and all of the other ones are just facades created by a command line utility called makefile. So in our JSON blob, since we record all of the metadata about a download, the byte size, and then the extended attributes that AutoPKG uses for comparison, we can go ahead and upon next time a VM spin, spins up, uh, create a facade file that AutoPKG can reference at the expected cache location. You might remember before, uh, the, it said that it was writing all of those files and all of those extended attributes uh, to the library AutoPKG cache location where AutoPKG looks for existing downloads for comparison. So when AutoPKG asks about this download, uh, it'll see that the file size is 650 megabytes. It can read its extended attributes and validates that it's not a new download, but without the baggage of actually consuming real disk space. So with the JSON blob populated of all of our recipe downloads, we can spin up a functional download cache, uh, write it very, very quickly to disk, uh, while only using an actual fraction of the disk space as part of this. Uh, for us at Kanji, uh, this has resulted in probably dozens and dozens of gigabytes of savings. Uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, just maintaining a flat file uh, that is at most probably half a megabyte uh, in terms of all of the JSON definitions uh, for all of the auto PKG downloads that we've had prior. And that is it. For anybody interested in learning more, or trying it out, uh, there is ample documentation uh, up on this GitHub uh, link page here. Uh, it kind of does a little more deep dive into the technical details, uh, as well as some instructions for getting started, some configuration options, and some other pieces. Uh, and before anybody asks, uh, Carl, yes, is a backronym uh, for cacheless auto PKG runner localized. So it looks like somebody really wanted it to spell Carl. 